Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. This will be part 357. <coughs> today, <coughs> we're focusing on the <coughs> lesson principle, Reality Constructs. What are reality constructs? Scripture indicates in the spiritual realm both YHVH and the Luciferians erect constructions. They build things mm -hmm. in the spiritual realm. They construct things in the spiritual realm. And <clears throat> the spiritual realm in which they construct things is known in the non-Christian circles as the astral realm. <clears throat> and these constructs influence the spiritual part of Adamic man. They are designed to bring about specific results. The Luciferians on one level, YHVH on another level. So let me answer this point. <clears throat> when a human travels into the astral plane. Is that human completely opening himself to whatever the construct can do? Because the construct, as I understand it, the construct, its purpose is to influence the human. Sure. So if the human puts himself directly in that environment, what do we understand? Well, that's why a lot of them don't come back. Mm. Yeah, you go into the spiritual realm, you've got no protection. Right. <clears throat> There's a book series you might like reading by a Frenchman who taught astral projection and his name was Y-R-A-M. You can look that up on, uh, okay. on yeah. Google. Y -R -A -M. Okay. And he French, talks, you say. Frenchman, yeah. And he I talks might be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> he talks about his experiences, he talks about the, um, <clears throat> the masters and things that um, they uh, <clears throat> would come back with and teach mm. from what they um, had observed on the astral plane. Turn to Isaiah, 25th chapter, verse 7. Isaiah 25, verse 7. And he, the Lord, will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. So he's talking about a Luciferian construct that affects all the human race. It's <coughs> unfortunate that man identifies himself as a physical being in a physical world which opens him uh, totally to Luciferian influence. If he realized he was a spiritual being in a physical world, he would look at his reality quite differently. Mm -hmm. but because he chooses to remain ignorant, <coughs> this enables the Luciferians to have uh, literally a field day in keeping the human race exactly where they want. Turn to St. Corinthians, 10th chapter, verse 4 to 5. As you're turning in Christ, only in Christ, is man given the ability to combat what the Luciferians are doing. 
Outside of Christ, man is defenseless. <clears throat> Paul, understanding this, speaks to the church about the availability of assets that will neutralize <clears throat> what the Luciferians are con constructing in the spiritual realm. <clears throat> For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, mm -hmm. casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself above the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, we come across <clears throat> the subject of strongholds. Strongholds are constructs in the spiritual realm that directly affect the spiritual Hence, the physical life of man. I'm going to propose a question to you. In the life of an individual, who builds the stronghold? The individual or the Luciferian? The Luciferian. Exactly. How are they able to build the stronghold in a person's life? By employing the pseudo-reality. Well, they can employ the pseudo reality, but that doesn't mean it's successful. Okay, by the person accepting that it's reality. Exactly. Same thing. Same exactly. Mm -hmm. They need the acquiescence right. of the victim mm -hmm. to be able to enslave the victim. Permission. Through the construct that they're designing. So when we talk about Christians being in strongholds, under strongholds, that concept hasn't been understood because we're really understanding it just now <coughs> that the stronghold isn't some thought of the human it is a reality to which the human has become part of exactly mm. it is a a structure built to inhibit and ultimately intimidate and ultimately control that individual mm. turn Ephesians The second chapter. Verse two. Where and in time past, <clears throat> you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. Notice what he says in alluding to your answer. Mm. In order to be influenced, you have to be in a mindset of disobedience. Because that will enable the individual to be vulnerable to the stronghold that the enemy wants to erect in his life. So we understand then that this is not a situation where the disobedience is the human speaking out the agreement, but in fact the behavior which is contrary to God is what actually is the permission That's standard. It. Mm. That's it. That's it. That's why man, <clears throat> when he fell, he came under Luciferian dominion. Right. Because he's in a position now, condition of disobedience. Mm. But <clears throat> just being in a condition of disobedience makes you vulnerable, but it does not enable the Luciferian to do what he wants to do. You have to <clears throat> be disobedient in a specific area so that the Luciferian has the <clears throat> availability to build the stronghold in your life. Notice verse 3 tells us how it's done. Among whom also we all had our conversation, a lifestyle, in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So human 
nature, <clears throat> just living a quote unquote normal human life gives the Luciferian all he needs to be able to enslave and destroy the individual. What does the individual what does the Luciferian do? He puts thoughts in the thought stream mm. that <clears throat> uh, basically incite the emotions, the desires, which are arrayed in a certain way in which they operate contrary to the will of God, the way of God. The individual <coughs> is set on the path when he's fulfilling this illegitimate desire. <clears throat> the Luciferian in the spiritual world is building the construct that ultimately will imprison him and bring about the judgment, the curse, whatever it is, as a result of what he's doing. So you therefore see that the more that the human enters into that pseudo-reality, the greater the hold that it has over him. Yes. Mm. Drugs. Yep. Reach a point where the person is so willing to put his life on the line to receive the exhilaration of the high that he will he will chance mm. dying yep. to do it, he's under control. Now, what we find here, <clears throat> we're talking about reality constructs. We say the Luciferians can build constructs in the spiritual realm. So does YHVH. But they're totally different with a totally different person. We're going to look at YHVH's construct. Turn to Ezekiel 8, verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> came to pass in the sixth year of the sixth month in the fifth day of the month as I sat in mine house the elders of Judah sat before me but the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me now this is YHVH this is not Halloween and I beheld in <clears throat> a likeness as the appearance of fire from the appearance of his loins even downward fire, and from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. So he sees the glory of YHVH, and he's trying to describe it. <clears throat> he put forth a form of an hand, and took me by a lock of mine head, <clears throat> and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven. So he's taken to a place between the earth and the heaven is suspended <coughs> it would be what in the vernacular would be called the astral plane right. and there he sees visions and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem now the visions of Elohim include constructs in the spiritual realm He's not taken to the physical Jerusalem. He's taken to a spiritual reality representing the physical Jerusalem. Is that true of John when he sees the Holy City? No. He sees the... He sees the real... The real spiritual Holy City. Yeah. Okay. He sees the totality of the Holy City, the physical basic physical harlot city he's looking into the future into the physical reality of things that are going to take place here Ezekiel is looking in a spiritual duplication of something that's physical <clears throat> he brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate 
that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. Now you remember, we, we were told about the spirit of jealousy in Leviticus. It talks about if the spirit of jealousy come upon a person, whether he knows it or whether he doesn't know it, that spirit can motivate that individual to believe he's done something whether he actually did it or didn't, right. or believe somebody else has done it. Wife, His yes. wife has <clears throat> gone out on him, mm. which may or may not be true. The spirit of jealousy has the ability <clears throat> to an open mind to put thoughts, strongholds, that re replicate reality. They believe what they've received from the spirit of jealousy. Mm. You see that every day. <clears throat> people become enraged over what they perceive as something real, but you perceive it as what, what, what get on the freeway. And somebody behind you is raging at you because they're thinking you're not, you're not moving fast enough to suit them. You have no idea that they're even behind you. But what you're looking at is the result of a spirit that has erected a stronghold in the mind of an individual who believes what he receives. He's living in a pseudo-reality. As though it's objective reality. <clears throat> and so, he lets you know by honking on his horn or whatever it is, tailgating you, that he's displeased with your activity. You don't even know the guy, didn't even know he's behind you. Reality, pseudo-reality has that ability. So we understand that uh, specifically the spirit of jealousy dwells and operates at that level only. It can't obviously be in the primary creation. No. It can only be in the fallen environment. Fallen. <coughs> but, but the point I'm trying to get to is that it exists in this construct area and not at a lower level of matter. No. Yeah. No. Because it feeds off of the human level of existence. Okay. So here he sees the source of it. It's in Jerusalem. And it says, <clears throat> this is seen in visions of God in the spiritual construct. Ezekiel sees things that are taking place that are actually resulting in the activities of the real Jerusalem on earth. So he says, <clears throat> The image of jealousy which provoketh to jealousy, verse 4, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision, 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 that I saw in the plain. In the astral plain, he sees this construct, which is giving him an understanding of why in the real Jerusalem they're behaving the way they behave. Now, what we find in the YGH construction, he goes far beyond what the Luciferians can do. The Luciferians can construct, they construct cities, they construct conditions, they can even construct weapons. But YGH being a reality unto himself, can construct total reality. Luciferians can. Well, hang on. When you say <coughs> they can't, I'm understanding you to mean why if we can um, construct a pure reality, the Luciferians can only construct a pseudo reality. That's what that's what you mean. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. But aren't white creations realities to some extent pseudo if he's also constructing in this region in this area. Oh, because of uh, the gasoline plane is an extension of Earth, which is corrupted. Okay. So you can construct something pure, but it can become tainted, right. which is what happened here. Now, what we find in this duplication, turn to Ezekiel <coughs> ninth chapter verses 1 to 2. Looking at the same 
pseudo reality, Jerusalem, its environs, the people are duplicated in this society. <clears throat> Verse 1 He cried also in mine ear with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near every one, every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. <clears throat> now, what we find here is a principle. When YHVH manifests a construct, he puts angels in charge over that construct. Jerusalem is a reality a construct mirroring the physical Jerusalem and everybody in it. Angels are administrating it. What does that mean? That means <clears throat> that in the real reality the angels that are administrating the pseudo reality have the authority to bless an individual in the real reality that's living and doing things for life. God. They can they have the authority to manifest a blessing in that life. Just as the Luciferians have the authority to manifest curses in the life that's yielded to them YHVH and the angels that he's put in administration over this reality can manifest a blessing in a life. So, should we understand that the fact that a predestinated heavenly um, counterpart exists for a person does not prevent or cannot prevent the pseudo construction of that person in this environment well we got to look at it differently okay. we're not talking about prototokis here we're talking about the Adamic race so, so this only refers to the Adamic race so the prototokis who have been inserted into the Adamic race do not uh, are not represented in these no. false these pseudo no areas. because in order for that you have to come out from under Elohim under YHVH's administration okay you never do okay so you're going to wrestle this stuff out of you. All right. <laughs> no you. we're talking about the human race that's in bondage right. and the things <clears throat> that are happening to it mm. so we see here a judgment <clears throat> the angels that are put in charge of this pseudo reality this replica of the genuine physical reality instead of being the benefactors that would bless these people become their judges <clears throat> verse 2 and behold six men came from the way of the higher gate which <clears throat> lieth toward the north every man a slaughter weapon in his hand one man among them was clothed with linen with a writer's inkhorn by his side. This is the recording angel. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. So they go in to receive their orders. And Marge V. H. Stokes tells them, well, you're going to judge. And this is how you're going to do it. Everybody who has been yielded to the Luciferian influence is going to die. Everybody who sighs who longs for righteousness, who longs for a relationship with me that's not being reflected in this reality, this city, you're going to preserve by putting a mark upon him. So the angels slaughtering in this construct, the manner in which the individual is slaughtered, does not represent the manner in which the physical human will die. That's right. Or it does represent. No, it, it doesn't. doesn't. It, it, so, it, so, in other words, this slaughter we're seeing here is the representation of the death of that person. Yes. And that person, the, the physical person, can die in whatever manner. What happened was, <clears throat> what they did here was to put the signet of approval on judgment on Jerusalem. Right. And everybody that would result in some aspect of that judgment. In the reality, the judgment was that <clears throat> Babylon would come down and take them captive and wipe them out. Okay. So another decision has to be made as to how the physical form is going to be judged. Well, what it would mean 
is that the person that's under judgment is going to die in a number of ways. Okay. He's wide open to whatever it is that's going to cause him to be taken out. The person who is sealed, no matter what happens, he is going to be preserved. Of course. And so this is what we see. Now, turn to Ezekiel, the 40th chapter. Again, we see another construct on the part of YHVH, which has nothing to do with this first construct. Ezekiel 40, we're going to go to verses 1 to 2. In the five and twentieth year of our captivity. So we want you to note in the physical there is no Jerusalem. Israel has come under the judgment that was pronounced in Ezekiel the ninth chapter. They're now captives in Babylon. But Ezekiel is taken to Jerusalem. In the five and twentieth year of our captivity, in the beginning of the year, in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year, after, after, after that the city was smitten. So in reality, Jerusalem is destroyed. It's rubble. In the self same day, so fourteen years after Jerusalem is destroyed, Ezekiel experiences this vision. <laughs> The hand of the Lord was upon me, YHVH, and brought me thither, thither. He brings him to the spot over where the physical Jerusalem lies destroyed. In the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel and sent me upon a very high mountain by which as the frame or the structure of a city on the south. So in the spiritual realm, Ezekiel is taken and he's set on a mountain overlooking Jerusalem. And he brought me thither. And behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed and he stood in the gate. Now remember what we said. When YHVH constructs in the spiritual realm he puts angels in charge of the con construct the reality. So John, so uh, Ezekiel begins to see the angelic group that is overseeing this reality. And the man said unto me, Son of man, behold with thine eyes, hear with thine ears, and set thine heart upon all that I shall show thee. For to the intent that I might show them unto thee art thou brought hither. Declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. So what YHVH is doing is preparing them for the time in which they're going to be released and go back and build what he now sees as a construct. Mm -hmm. This construct is being shown to him so he can write down the specifics of it so that people like Zerubbabel and uh, <clears throat> Ezra when they go back, they're going to build the city and the temple according to the measurements that Ezekiel has put forth. And those measurements are from the construct in the spiritual realm. It has to be to a T. No deviation whatsoever. Now, 
Scripture indicates YHVH, being a reality unto himself, is able to manifest realities rather than simple constructs, whereas the Luciferians can only manifest constructs within the confines of a reality. YHVH is able to manifest a to total reality because he is a reality personified. You should understand then that the Luciferians can only manifest constructs within his YHVH's construct. That's what you're saying. Okay. Yes. So therefore, not outside of his construct. No. Hmm. They cannot, Lucifer cannot, cannot construct a reality on the order that YHVH is constructing a reality. All Lucifer can do is try to corrupt that reality. That's how you describe it. So it's not Lucifer overriding YHVH's reality. You wouldn't describe it like that. No. Just corrupt the reality. Okay. All he can do is imitate, duplicate right. what has already gone forth because right. he is not that higher ordained. The level that YHVH operates on in the Dawnstar hierarchy <coughs> is the level of creators within a creation. Sure. Yes. Is Lucifer going to be successful? Successful in Corrupting a, a, a YTH reality. Sure. Sure. It's been so far, hasn't it? <laughs> Every time the YTH has done something, he's been corrupted by mm. Lucifer. That's why stations angels there. But that's contingent on the individuals in the reality being obedient to God. Right. That's why I was thinking. If there's angels posted there, then what are they doing if the thing gets corrupted anyway? Well, then they're going to become angels of judgment rather than angels of blessing. But it's because the human chooses to every single accept time the pseudo, you know, the mimic reality. Because the of the way that Lucifer in in engages in corrupting the individual a stronghold in the mind of an individual. <coughs> I don't care how pristine an environment he's in, mm -hmm. he's going to corrupt it. So it doesn't matter how many um, angels are stationed by y 3 h in a given uh, place, as long as the human accepts the pseudo-reality, you can have a million eight, it makes no difference. It makes because no difference. as far as the, the human is concerned, that's what's real. Remember what we read in Ephesians. We all at one time, a lifestyle, was predicated off of the lifestyle of those that were disobedient, living right. in disobedience. Right. When you live in a way contrary to what God is, God always puts His people in a pristine paradise. They corrupt it. Just like what they're doing now. They take something good and they make it a mess. Mm. They make it of such a hideous uh, uh, um, functioning that all only a thing that is good for us to be destroyed, wiped out. Never changes. It's like trying to put a pig in a perfume shop. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not. It's not going to work. I've heard a pig in a wedding dress. <laughs> okay, we get the point. All right. Turn Ezekiel 47, and we see how this this construct here is consist consistently being added to. Ezekiel 47, starting in verse 1. So we see there's a bunch of chapters here talking about <coughs> the uh, the construct of YHVH. Because it has so many different functions that they're trying to get across to the prophet to pass on to Israel. What YHVH wants them to do is to prepare for the ultimate release. They, uh, Jeremiah said you're going to be there for 70 years. This takes place 25 years after they're in captivity. Ezekiel is being given the, the tablets to pass on to the generation that's going to come after his generation, which will be the generation that will see the deliverance out of Babylonian captivity and they'll be prepared to go back and erect Jerusalem in a way in which it's going to be beautiful, it's going to be uh, a, a thing in which God's people will enjoy life and everything else, but it falls on deaf 
ears. So we understand that when somebody travels into the astral realm, they believe that they're experiencing the creator's version or the creator's in, in, original creation is what I'm trying to say. Having no concept, no idea that this is a mimic. Yes. Wow. Yes. Um, you get people that have visions, they think they've gone to heaven. Right. Uh, yes. What about these... Uh, visionaries project them their oh, yes. remote, remote viewing. Remote viewing. Yes. What See, do they do? Plane. So they're right. Okay. So again. You're open to dependent upon who the individual is, sure. his capacity, what he is he seeing, and even then it can be interrupted by beings. It's been said. They've been seeing things and suddenly they'll have somebody say you're not gonna relate what you saw. Gotcha. You're gonna only be able to have a call. It's the astral plane. So you were just about to say the person visiting the astral plane believes that they've gone to heaven. Yeah, you look at the internet. People tell you, well, I met Jesus and he told me this. Right. I, I went to hell and I, Jesus showed me this, right. this, this, and this. Mormons. There was a Mormon woman that died and went to heaven, quote unquote, mm -hmm. was told the future, met <clears throat> the spirit being that would become her son in the physical and she was told one thing and another, a Mormon woman. So the idea is, only a person with the Holy Spirit is going to see the truth. Because the Holy Spirit <clears throat> isn't going to operate in the astral plane, it's going to operate in the true heavens. So, so therefore that person would immediately, if they were that, they would immediately know the, the difference they could discern. Yeah. Okay, we're in Ezekiel 47. I'm going to read verses 1 to 10. You're going to see the progressive manifestation of YHVH adding to not only the city, the environs, but the whole region. As Ezekiel is writing down, observing all of this. <clears throat> Afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house. Uh, from Ezekiel 40 to 47, uh, he's given instruction detailed instruction about every single building in Jerusalem, its size, its measurement, what it's for, uh, how it fits with YHVH's plan for um, the sacrifices and for the society. What he's being given is the Jerusalem that's going to exist when, when Elohim comes for the gathering. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, for the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from, from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. So what's happening here is, after he gets through being given all the information about the city, YHVH is manifesting more into this reality for Ezekiel. He's adding, he sees the waters. The waters are extending the parameters of this reality beyond the city. Note what he goes on to say. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way without unto the outer gate, utter gate by the way that looketh eastward, and behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. And he brought me through the waters. The waters were to the ankles. So the waters are getting higher and higher and higher as Ezekiel is being shown more and more things. Does that represent the building of the structures, the buildings? Represent something else. Okay, you're okay. You're gonna see. Again he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the knees. Again he measured a thousand and brought me through, and the waters were to the loins. Afterward he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen. Waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, 
Hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. In other words, the bank of the river. This thing started as a stream and trickle. Now it's a wide, encompassing, powerful river. Now when I had returned, behold, <clears throat> at the bank of the river were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country. Go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live, and there shall be a great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither. You notice he's using the future term, yes. shall, yes. shall. And they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the Father shall stand upon it from Engedi, even to Engliam. They shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of a great sea exceeding many. So he goes on to talk about what Daniel, I mean what Ezekiel first saw as a city with the environs now becomes a total region. He's giving him a greater and a greater expanded view of this reality. The way it's going to be at the time that Israel is gathered back to the land. So these waters turn into a great sea. Not only a sea, <coughs> it turns into a flourishing uh, place in which you have trees, foliage, people who are engaging in fishing activities, farming, other things. So Ezekiel is being given an expanded view of this reality that YHVH is adding to as Ezekiel looks. Mm. It's not just a thing that he suddenly brought into being in its completion. It's something that he is progressively expanding so Ezekiel will give a comprehension of the complexity and the totality of it so he can write it and give it to his people so that he can be prepared for it. So you've said that this is the future of the physical Jerusalem. This sounds like a restoration. It is. Does that include the restoration that will come at the end of the Second Coming? No. Only the gathering. the gathering, strictly, the gathering. because it'd be destroyed again during the tribulation. Yes. Yeah. It's going to be two gatherings. Okay. Yes. It sounds suspiciously close to what Al Haim's going to do with us. Sure. But but Wyatt is doing it on a much smaller scale, but nonetheless he's creating as 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 they're experiencing. Turn to, adding to it, you know. Turn to Deuteronomy 32. Well, why is Creator is showing Ezekiel? See, he never gives Elohim the overall credit. He's showing him this is what I'm going to do for you, what I'm going to do for you, what I'm going to do for you. <laughs> but when you look at the overall picture, he's doing what he's been instructed by Halloween to do. Without See, saying what he's been instructed. Deuteronomy 32. Maybe we as sons are supposed to already know that. <laughs> you will. You will know. <laughs> well, yeah, I know because of you, Mr. Jones, but the thing with this is average human isn't going to pick up on what we just know. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 8, Deuteronomy 32. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, the sons of Adam are the elder group. He redeemed us from every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. He then takes Israel, which is given under the hand of Apple and Zach. Y H V H. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> when he separated the sons of Adam, these are Gentiles, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Here you have the separation. The sons of Adam, Israel. 
For the Lord's portion is his people Jacob. Now this is YHVH. This is not Elohim any longer. Jacob is a lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land, in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about, instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. So he's leading them out of the destruction of the current Adamic order into the land that you just saw, right. the vision given to right. Ezekiel. But he's acting as though he's the one, the soul. Sure. Just like he did with Moses. You know, I've heard the cry of my people. I've come down here to take you out and deliver you. Well, the Elohim told told um, Abraham 400 years earlier, right. you're going to be in bondage for 400 years and then you're going to come out. And I'll destroy those people that kept your people in bondage. Mm -hmm. uh, White Tree has never told Moses that part of the story. Of course not. Just like he doesn't tell Ezekiel that part of the story will be when Elohim comes and divides the nations, then this vision that you're seeing here will be a reality on the physical earth. And uh, at that time, this is what it's going to look like. It gives them a, a running view of the scenery, of the land. Right. <clears throat> which is exactly what happens at this time. So when the, the, the waters are, for want of a better term, marking the parameters of the city, this equates with according to the number of the children of, of Israel. In other words, the waters mark out the parameters uh, required to hold the totality of the children of Israel. YHVH's vision is <coughs> orchestrated by Elohim. Yeah. The, 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 the diameters, the expanse. He's giving Ezekiel the the Israelite portion, but when you look at it from the Prototokos vision, you're getting this portion, the global context. Where Israel fits in is Ezekiel uh, 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 47. Where Prototokos fits in is Deuteronomy 32, the global portion. YHVH has only got authority over Israel. He can't do anything to the sons of Adam. He has nothing to do with their inheritance, which is the church communities. His whole authority is just limited to Israel, whom he's trying to prepare for a re-entrance into Mosaic society. Mm. This sacrifice, that sacrifice, the Levites being restored, David descended, David being put on the throne, and all of that stuff. If the son of Adam, Protodicus, speaks to White VH before the gathering, would White VH speak with that son of Adam? It depends on the uh, position of the son of Adam. Let's say that. Elohim I mean, a, uh, a an elder, angel, yeah, who could only be a priest that would speak to YHVH because nobody else has the knowledge. Right. But my question is, would YHVH tell the priest what the priest wants to know? Bearing, sure. in, mind, bearing in mind that this would be before the gathering. Well, it would be just the opposite. YHVH couldn't tell the priest anything because he doesn't know. Right. So the priest, the priest would tell YHVH just like John talks to YHVH in Revelation. 10 and 11. But he's told to. He's given a book. Right. He says to John, eat the book. Right. And it'll be in your mouth sweet as honey and your belly bitter. But you got to prophesy all the things in this book. So YHVH only has a limited knowledge. Okay. John has a full knowledge. Right. YHVH can't give John a conversation about anything because he doesn't know. Right. Well, I wasn't really going as far as conversations. Mm -hmm. I was pointing out the priest acquiring comprehension of certain things may want to ask a question of YH3H, where YH3H just says yes or no, for example. If that was such a situation, in other words, he's not being, YH3H is not being asked comprehension that he doesn't have, he's being asked something that he may know about the war systems, for example. What would he say is what I'm getting to. Well, he would say whatever he knew, but I'd have to, I'd have to add to that. Hmm. A priest wouldn't be motivated to ask YHVH anything even before he becomes yeah. an angel. Because he knows. Because he, YHVH yeah. is asked, asked to ask him. It's the priest that has the spirit right. of wisdom and revelation and prophecy. YHVH doesn't have it. I might test him, though, just to see if he'll give any credit to it. But we already know the answer. <laughs> we already so. know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So this is what you have here, the, 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 the bare bones of this particular situation. Mm. Once again, Brother Richard, 
thank you for being obedient to your calling and giving us this opportunity to go beyond our imaginations. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Richard.